The back of a Chinook helicopter is a very noisy environment. It's stiflingly hot, and this isn't helped by the helmet or body armour that I'm wearing, or the massive amount of equipment that I also have to carry. I look out the back, and I can see the brown, barren, dusty landscape of Afghanistan passing by as the helicopter moves forward. And then I look across from me, and there's Richie, one of the searchers. He's holding onto the seat for dear life. His eyes are as wide as saucers. And of course, I'm laughing at his discomfort. I feel the helicopter slow. And I stop laughing, because now I have to get ready to do my job. It hits the ground with a thud. Bang! The back ramp comes down and we file off it in double time, fanning out behind the helicopter and take a knee as it disappears into the distance. Waka, 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 waka. We're left in an eerie silence and a big brown dust cloud that we can't see through. As the dust begins to settle, I see a figure in the distance. I can see that this figure is carrying a rifle. My heart starts beating faster, and I start to panic slightly. I pull my rifle tighter into my shoulder and turn it towards this person as he walks towards me. As he gets closer, I can see that he's carrying the same rifle and wearing the same equipment as me. Fortunately, this is friend and not foe, and I feel a bit silly that I panicked a little and was so alert. And then I look around at all my lads, and I can see they're looking a little bit sheepish, because they panicked as well. But we don't talk about that. He introduced himself. Hello, I'm Bob. Hello, I'm Ken. What have you got for me, Bob? Well, last night, the Taliban came and they planted six IEDs along a track. We've been down this morning and we've searched and we've found the first bomb. We've marked it, come back here and called you in. Great. The compound's about 50 metres away. Now... Believe it or not, back then, I was a little bit slimmer and a little bit fitter. And despite the heat and all the equipment that we're carrying, I covered that distance really quickly and really easily. I climbed up to a watchtower and looked out to where the track is. We're on top of a hill that rolls down into a valley with a river running from left to right. Over the river is a concrete bridge, and beyond that is the track that Bob patrolled down earlier. And then beyond that is a field, and I can see the Afghan farmers ploughing in the field. Now, they're not using a tractor like we might use over here in the United Kingdom. This is really old school. They're using an ox and plough, toiling away under the sun. And it gives me confidence that they're there, because I know if the Taliban, the enemy, are anywhere around, they wouldn't be in that field. They'd have gone to the safety of their compound. I quickly formulate a plan and brief my team. We've done this many, many times before. So it's quite quick. We work our way out the back of the compound, going through the razor wire that protects it, down the hill, and stop about 30 metres from the bridge. I have to think like the Taliban. I have to think, how would I take me on? There's only one concrete bridge over the river. And if I was the Taliban, I'd put a bomb under the bridge, knowing that we have to cross it. I said, one of my lads out to the left, one of my lads out to the right. They move forward to the water's edge, and they look under the bridge using the optics on their rifle. The guy on the left gives me a thumbs up. Clear, boss! The guy on the right gives me a thumbs up. Clear, boss! And we proceed across the bridge. When we get over the bridge, I can see the mine tape that Bob used to mark the bomb. We're a safe distance away, so we go into autopilot. Someone over there is setting up a machine gun to protect us. Someone over there is on the radio telling the headquarters that we've arrived at the scene. Someone over there is setting up a piece of equipment, and then someone hands me the Valon. And the Valon is a British Army metal detector. As its name suggests, it detects metal in the ground. The terrorists use metal when they're making the bombs. Fortunately for me, it also detects coins, but they're mine to keep... That's just a perk of the job. But its main job is to set bombs in the ground. I set off towards the bomb, sweeping the valon from left to right, left to right as I go. As I near the bomb, 
suddenly the valance starts vibrating in my hand and making a really annoying ee! And just in case I've missed those two things, oh, it has some nice pretty lights that flash at me to tell me it's detected some metal. I turn the valance off because that sound is really annoying. And it's no good to me anymore. I put it down. And then I take out the most important piece of equipment that I have in Afghanistan. It's not that valid worth thousands of pounds. It is a paintbrush. Yep, you heard right. Just a paintbrush. You could probably go down to your local store and buy one for about a pound. But this being the army, it probably costs about £300. That's just how procurement works. I take my helmet off because I want to be comfortable. It's no good to me if this bomb explodes now. And I lie down. Now, I know that this bomb will probably have some explosives in the ground. And I know that will probably be about the size of a PlayStation box. And I know that on top of that will be a pressure plate. And that will comprise of two pieces of metal on top of each other, separated by an insulator. And that is designed when someone steps on it, the two pieces of metal come together and cause an electric circuit to energise cause the explosives to go off and I know that the pressure plate is connected to the explosives by some electrical wires and therefore I know that if I could cut one of these wires I could make that bomb safe I lie down and I brush slowly down the side of the pressure plate I get to the bottom there's no wire what am I going to do I start to panic again I have to say to myself, stop, think, rely on your training, rely on your experience. What are you going to do now? I take a breath and I brush down the other side. And a wire pops up and I'm so relieved. Whew. Now, this isn't Hollywood and I'm not going to take out my snips and cut that wire while I'm down at the bomb. It's far safer if I'm back where the rest of my team are. So I place a piece of equipment to cut the wire and I go back where everyone else is. We fire off the piece of equipment and cut the wire. Then I go back down to the bomb, make sure the wire's cut, and then I remove the pressure plate and I remove the battery. And now I have a very satisfying part of the job. I take some of my own explosives, put it on the terrorist explosives, go back to where the lads are, we fire off the explosives for a very nice, loud, big bang, a safe distance away. But there's six of these bombs. This is just the first one. We have to find the other five. Now, remember Richie? Terrified of flying. He now does the most dangerous job in Afghanistan. And he starts to search along the track as the lead searcher. We go a short distance down the track. He takes an Ian. Brushes at the ground with his fingertips. Boss, think I've got one. I step forward and have a look over his shoulder and I can see what appears to be the edge of another pressure plate. Nice one, Richie. Let's get back somewhere safe. Go back along the track that we've already searched. Now, there's about 15 people on this track and it's very narrow. Very difficult for me to work in these conditions and for everyone to be safe. So I ask Richie to start searching an area in a field that's right beside us. As he does that, Lauren steps forward. Now Lauren is the search team commander. His job is to watch the other searchers doing their job to make sure that they do it properly. He's on this track that's already been searched and he takes only two steps, maybe a metre, two metres away from me. And then he says, I'm stuck. I'm laughing at him. What an idiot. Fancy getting stuck on a track in Afghanistan. I step forward to help him. But he hasn't got his foot stuck in a round animal hole. When I look down, I can see that the edge of the hole that his feet are stuck in are straight. That means someone has dug this hole. And there's only one reason people dig holes in tracks in Afghanistan. And that's to put bombs in. Lauren has stood on a bomb and it hasn't gone off. 
I should run away. I should make myself safe. But I can't do that. I'm a soldier. I'm part of this team. This team have helped me. They've got me there. They've found bombs for me to deal with. They've prepared equipment. They've protected me while I've been dealing with the bombs. We all work together and look after each other. Otherwise, it's just not worth doing it. We'd never succeed. So I have to help Lauren. I grab hold of him so he doesn't move. And I drag my right foot around the side of him, looking for this wire. There's no wire, but that'll be all right. There's a wire on the other side, surely. And I drag my left foot around him. But there's no wire. All of the bomb is under all of Lauren's feet. I can't dig in from the side. It takes far too long. We don't have minutes. We probably only have seconds. I have to do something. I have to do something quickly. Lauren stood on the bomb and it didn't go off. So if he just comes straight off the bomb, the chances are that it just won't go off. So I go to lift Lauren off the bomb. And boom! And then it goes, just like Hollywood. Everything's really slow. And I'm flying through the air with this high-pitched sound in my ears. And I'm thinking, this is going to hurt when I land. And it did hurt when I landed. And then I felt no more pain. But all I could do was shout, I'm still here, I'm still here. And then I must have blacked out. And someone shouted my name, Ken, Ken, Ken. Yeah, I'm still here, I'm still here. And every time I blacked out, they'd shout my name. And that's how I'd respond. And then one time I came around and I could hear the waka 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 of the helicopter. I could feel the immense dow draft of the rotor blades. And the amazing heat from the engines. And I could hear people talking, but I couldn't hear what they were saying. I'm still here, I'm still here. And then someone put their hands inside of my head and said, we have got you. And I went to sleep. I woke up five weeks later from a coma and I remember the smell of the clean, fresh sheet that was on me. I opened my, eye, my eyes and I could see the sheet went over a big metal cage that was holding my hips together from the explosion. It was really annoying because I couldn't see around me and I wanted to look at all the pretty nurses that were about. I had bandages all the way up so that only my shoulders were exposed. My arms were completely bandaged. And they wheeled me down and they left me in a bay with other injured soldiers. They looked after me, but I had lots of time to think for myself. And to begin with, I was just glad to be alive. But over the days and weeks, the nurses had to do everything for me. They had to wash me. They had to feed me. They even had to give me drinks of water. I couldn't even press the call bell. I used to have to shout them, Nurse! Nurse! I must have been so annoying. But they never showed it. I wanted to give up. I didn't want to go on. I just wanted to die. I didn't want to be there. I wanted to throw off my bed because I wanted to be back in Afghanistan. I wanted to be on the tracks dealing with the bombs. I wanted my team around me. Or I should be dead like Lauren. I just wanted to die. But I was that useless I couldn't do anything about that either. So I just lay there feeling sorry for myself. One day, Bouncing down the corridor was a figure with a big mop of curly hair and a big smile on her face. And I could tell she was a captain because she had three pips on each shoulder. She introduced herself. Hello, I'm Anne. I'm your physio. And we're going to do some physio today. You're mad. All I had to do was roll on my side. All she wanted me to do was roll on my side. 
How hard can it be? I was a supremely fit soldier. I'd spent many months in Afghanistan. And we roll on our side all the time. I'm sure everyone does it in their sleep. Just turns over, rolls on the side, nice and comfortable. Carry on sleeping. That session only lasted 20 minutes. And I threw my arm over and I failed. And I threw my arm over and I failed. And I never did get to roll on my side. But it was the hardest 20 minutes of physical effort I had in my whole life. I felt even worse. And she came back the next day and the same thing happened and I failed and I failed and I failed. And then she came back on the third day and I didn't want to do this because what was the point? I was just useless. There was nothing I could do. I threw my arm over and I failed. I threw my arm over and I failed. And I threw my arm over and I'm on my side. I've not just turned on my side. I've turned a corner. I realised that with a little bit of help, I could do things. And hadn't ordered me to do this. She'd encouraged me to do this. She'd inspired me to do this. And now I want to do more. I want to do the next thing. What's next, Anne? How do we go on from here? And that's what we did. We just worked hard at the physio. One of the biggest things that frustrated me was that I couldn't have a hot drink. The nurses couldn't give me a hot drink for fear of spilling it down me. So it was always cold water. That gets really boring after a few weeks. I was really dying for a cup of tea. And then one day I woke up and someone had put a cup on my table. And it was a thermos cup, you know, the type with cool walls and a, and a top so you don't spill it. But it had a hole in the middle where you could put your hand. Now, this was by design. This wasn't a, a design fault. The tea was still held within there. So I could put my hand through and I could take a drink and I could have a drink of hot tea. And as any soldier will tell you, if you can have a drink of tea, it doesn't matter what the problem, you'll be able to deal with anything. So, with that hot tea, the help of people like Anne, and technology to get on, I knew that despite my injuries, that somehow I was going to make it through life. That's my story. Thank you very much for listening. And cheers. Cheers.